Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, apparently, I am on air now, and this is my first time ever doing a Google Hangout like this. So, uh, yeah, this is exciting. Um, I, so by the way, I'm totally ignorant about how this works. So, <laughs> um, I should be able to see you guys commenting and stuff but I can't, um, and I'm not totally sure how to go about doing that. So bear with me as I um, <laughs> look stuff up here. Hold on, I'm gonna... Uh, let's see, events. So I see that there's some cool people in the comment section. If I actually go on to the, um, the live page, <laughs> um, if anyone can tell me in the comments here, how do I look at comments while I'm uh, in the uh, on-air app? If anyone can tell me in the comments here, how do I look at comments while I'm uh, in the uh, on-air app. If anyone can tell me in the comments here, how do I look at comments? <laughs> By the way, this library, I'm house sitting right now. I'm, I'm watching this little dog right here. I don't know if you can see her. Come here. Come on. I'm, this is not my library. I wish it was. By the way, this library, I'm house sitting right now. I'm, I'm watching this little dog right here. All right, uh, yeah, okay, so I'm getting told that I am having an echo. You can watch the comment stream on the playback. Okay, well, I guess I have to um, keep an eye on both things here. What I'm going to do, um, because I can't look at comments while I'm actually just using the on-air app, um, <laughs> I should have kept this a secret. I should have told everyone this is my library. Yeah. Um, because I can't look at comments while I'm doing the, the, <laughs> while I'm in the broadcasting app, I will go back and forth. So kind of between uh, major parts of the presentation, I'll come back here and look at comments and try and respond to comments, and then I'll go back to my presentation. So I've got a couple of things I'm going to be doing here. Um, originally, I wanted to talk about to answer three different questions. One um, is on butterflies, how did butterflies evolve, particularly how did metamorphosis evolve. One is on how did, uh, how did the countercurrent heat exchange system in whale testicles evolve? <laughs> and um, then, oh, am I still getting uh, reverb, people? So what I did is I turned the sound down on my computer. So I'm hope hopefully that's ended the reverb. Um, okay, cool. People are saying that I'm good now. All right, great. Um, and then the, the third question I was going to answer here today is how does evolution take something from no function to function? How, how does function evolve from non-function? And that third question, uh, as I was preparing slides last night, I realized that is a huge um, topic in and of itself. And I think I should probably do an entire video just about that. So I'm going to do, I'm going to save that for next Sunday. So today um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to share with you some slides of mine. So let me share my screen here. Share screen. And we'll uh, we'll jump into this.
Okay, Google Hangouts is sharing your screen. <laughs> um, okay. So, again, bear with me, folks. I'm totally new to this. Uh, uh, hopefully, hopefully this will be a thing that I do regularly. Hopefully, this Sunday morning science thing will be, you know, something that I do every week. Uh, we'll see how this this first attempt goes. So. Metamorphosis. This is the question that I got in. Metamorphosis, what were the stages by which it evolved? And uh, I, hopefully I'm pronouncing this name right. Rody Green uh, asked that. Roddy, Rody, <laughs> Rudy. So butterflies are absolutely amazing. These are two owl butterflies that I got to hang out with when I was in Ecuador uh, a few months back. Uh, Nancy Miarelli took me on a tour, uh, an insect tour, and one of our stops was this butterfly farm. These <laughs> butterflies are absolutely amazing. They got this, th these, uh, these eye spots on them that look just like eyes, including the little highlight spots, which I think is great. And this is supposedly a defense against predators, having these creepy looking eyes on their uh, wings creeps out uh, you know, potential predators. But metamorphosis is an absolutely spectacular thing. I mean, when I first started learning about evolution, first started thinking about evolution, metamorphosis was one of the one of the issues that I had with evolution. How on earth could something this spectacular have evolved? Because when I was probably in second grade, maybe it was third grade, our teacher brought in some caterpillars. We had this little terrarium set up with caterpillars in it and the, they were uh, monarch butterflies. They were eating milkweed and we watched them form a chrysalis and we watched them come out of that chrysalis and turn into butterflies. Absolutely spectacular. If you've never done this, I highly recommend, um, you, know, you, you can buy them online and you can, you can watch this happen on your own. It's a really, really fascinating process. And, the they're just amazing, amazing animals. These caterpillars are nothing like the adults. They eat completely different food. The adults eat um, eat nectar mainly, and the the uh, larvae, the caterpillars, they eat plant material. They just they munch on leaves. Very fascinating process. This this the, 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 these animals do this. It's almost like they're two completely separate animals from uh, from larva to adult. And here we have a chrysalis. Uh, a lot of people think that butterflies spin a cocoon and that the chrysalis is a cocoon. It's not. Um, you see up top here, there's a little bit of um, silk that's holding the chrysalis to the, um, in this case, it's a piece of wood here. The, the chrysalis is actually just the animal's skin. When you, have a, when you have a caterpillar like this, it attaches itself to a stick when it's mature. And then it actually sheds its skin. The chrysalis uh, is in a layer underneath the caterpillar. It, it forms in a layer underneath and the, the caterpillar's skin is shed. And then the chrysalis is shed again and out comes the butterfly. So that's how, that's how the process works. It's a, it's a type of molting. You know, molting is very common in insects of all kinds. And so metamorphosis has these, you know, well, a butterfly goes through four life stages. It starts out as an egg, hatches as larva out of that egg, and the larva grows and, and changes quite a bit throughout its, its life, throughout the caterpillar's life. Then it goes into a pupa stage, the chrysalis, and then it comes out of that as an adult. And one of the reasons that I struggled to understand how this could have evolved when I first started thinking about evolution and remembering back to my days in elementary school when, when we had seen this happen is I thought when I first started, you know, this was in high school, I suppose, um, uh, maybe middle school when I first started learning about evolution, thinking about evolution. At the time, I thought that butterflies and moths were the only things that went through metamorphosis. And you know, it's like it, this unique thing for butterflies and moths. And how on earth would something like that evolve? That didn't make any sense to me, right? But are butterflies and moths really alone in this thing that we call metamorphosis? 
no, they are not alone. Um, beetles go through metamorphosis. Here on the left here, we, we see a, a, a beetle larva, this, this worm-like guy. And then we see a beetle pupa. So it's like a beetle chrysalis, you could say, um, on the right. And then behind this guy's hand, he's holding what the actual, there's, there's a, what the actual adult beetles look like. This is a Hercules beetle. It's a giant, giant beetle. And then on the right here, I've got uh, baby bees. Bees start out as little larvae, little maggot-like critters. Well, they start out as eggs, which those are eggs that you see on the right. Then you see the, the larva um, on the left here. And absolutely fascinating. And then, of course, flies start out as maggots, right? So metamorphosis is extremely common. And... <laughs> It turns out that there are <laughs> most species of animals on earth are beetles, <laughs> you know? Um, and so it turns out that, that well, not most, a, a huge percentage of the species on earth are beetles. There are 350,000 species of beetle that have been recognized and named. There's only 250,000 species of plants and there's only 4,000 species of mammals. And so when you think about all the different types of animals that go through metamorphosis, you know, a huge percentage of animals species on planet earth are species that go through metamorphosis. So butterflies and moths are definitely not alone in this. Metamorphosis is an extremely common process in the animal kingdom. Uh, and uh, hold on, let me go back here. One of the big benefits of metamorphosis is that metamorphosis, uh, it allows the parent and the child to not compete with each other for food resources. That's when, when evolutionary biologists look at this and, and try and figure out what the heck, what the heck is metamorphosis really doing for these animals? What it's doing is it's allowing the parents and offspring not to compete with each other for food because the parents eat nectar and the offspring, they or you know, the larva, they eat uh, plant material. This is not the case with humans, you know, humans, uh, the parents and the children eat pretty much the same thing. And so we're, we're we really are in competition with each other for resources. Um, we've evolved this, these strong parental instincts that stop us from competing with each other, but we are in competition with each other for resources. Even when a, a baby is still drinking milk, it's taking that milk directly from the mother. So there is this competition between a uh, parent and child, which does not exist in animals that go through metamorphosis. So that's, that is the most obvious benefit of metamorphosis. And that's why metamorphosis is so common among animals, uh, animal species. You could also say that um, frogs undergo metamorphosis and for a similar reason, the, the tadpoles and the adult frogs eat different uh, food sources. So um, forward here, uh, there's, a, there's a comment uh, back in the, Back in the 60s, there was a biologist, and I'm, I'm blanking on his name right now. I had notes that I had written, but I don't know what I did with those. They're somewhere in the other room. <laughs> but uh, he was asked, um, you know, what is it that biology can tell us about God? And uh, he said, well, when you look at biology, you realize that if, if God is real and he did create life on earth, he has an inordinate... Uh, uh, an inordinate love for beetles because there are so many of them compared to all the other species. I thought that was kind of funny. Um, we can think of a caterpillar as a fetus that was born early and went out and started getting its own food and then uh, kind of went dormant again to mature into an adult form. So we actually go through dramatically different body stages as well, just like a caterpillar does to a butterfly. But most of those dramatic changes happen while we're still safely inside the womb. You know, we start out, this is a human fetus. I forget uh, the age that this fetus is at. This is a, this is a human. <laughs> it's got a little tail there. It's got two, the, it's got little, um, little leg buds down at the bottom, that kind of, um, that bulge down there. And those are leg buds. And on the side, 
um, here are arm buds, just kind of getting started there. And one of the really fascinating things about um, a chrysalis, you know, when a, when a caterpillar goes into this chrysalis stage, if you were to cut open a chrysalis, all sorts of goo would leak out because what happens while, when the, um, when the animal is in chrysalis form is a bunch of its cells dissolve and, um, and they, new cells start forming, start growing and start developing the adult uh, body parts. And this, this cell death is called apoptosis. And it's a process that our bodies go through too, quite dramatically uh, when we're fetuses. So you can see these little arm buds coming out here. Uh, we actually grow flippers <laughs> as hands. And then we go through apoptosis between the fingers and our hands to, to, to slice up that flipper into the five fingers that we end up having as, as we mature. And so this process of development and then uh, cell death is super common in our own bodies. This is common all across biology. And it, it seems really magical, really special in metamorphosis in butterflies because so much of it happens all at once. But this process is normal. This is a normal thing that happens in all organisms. And so it's, it's not, when you start to learn this, you start to realize that metamorphosis is not as strange as it seems at first. Uh, all organisms go through this. Really the big difference is that uh, the caterpillar goes through, you know, it, it hatches and it lives its life in its uh, fetal stage for a while. And then it goes dormant and then matures into an adult and then lives its life as an adult. That's, that's the main difference between butterflies and humans, for example. Now, not all insects go through metamorphosis, but all insects do go through a, um, you know, a gradual process of going from baby to adult. This here, these are uh, milkweed bugs. And you can see here on the right, we've got little babies. They've got little stubby wings that don't work that are kind of underneath their, <laughs> their um, exoskeletons there. And then on the left here, we've got the adult with full, nice, mature wings. And with these insects, um, here's, here's more examples of them. They go through multiple stages. They go through multiple molts throughout their life. And each time they molt, they change a little bit. Um, and when... When we, when we compare this type of, of uh, life cycle, it's pretty much exactly the same as metamorphosis, except for the changes that happen. The, these little spurts of cell death and growth, they happen incrementally. They happen uh, a little bit at a time. Whereas in a butterfly or a beetle, they go into a dormant stage, the, the, the chrysalis, and then they go through massive amounts of change all at once. So you can really think of this as uh, a metamorphosis as a condensed uh, normal growth of an insect. It just, all of that happens at once. We kind of do this as well. We have a puberty stage and during puberty, actually there's, there's actually a lot of cell death during puberty. Our sex organs go through a lot of cell death during puberty and growth at the same time. Um, there's So we actually kind of go through a type of metamorphosis, though it's much more mild than butterflies do. So again, this is very, very familiar to us when we, <laughs> when we dig in and start looking at all the examples that exist um, in nature. This is a silverfish, and silverfish go through no metamorphosis at all. So these these uh, milkweed bugs go through what what some people call partial metamorphosis. Um, it's actually got, it's called uh, <laughs> hemimetabolous um, metamorphosis. That, or that's their that's their um, growth style. That's the technical word for it. And metamorphosis is hollow metabolis. But silkworms, or sorry. Uh, Silverfish don't go through any sort of metamorphosis at all. They just they just go through uh, growth stages where it, pretty much the the babies when they hatch uh, they already look like miniature adults and they just get bigger when they molt and 
they they just kind of grow up as a baby as you would ex- as you would expect um, a really simple form of maturation to to work. They do inside the egg. They they kind of go through these same fetal stages. They they go through a larval like stage, but that, that happens all inside the egg, just like for us, it happens inside the womb. Caterpillars are just uh, exceptions where they come out early. So, metamorphosis. What are the stages by which it evolved? This is pretty much it. There are these three stages that we can see in living organisms today and in in insects today. We can see that there are insects that go through no metamorphosis, metamorphosis at all. There are insects that go through partial metamorphosis, and there are insects that go through full-blown metamorphosis. And we can think of this full-blown metamorphosis as just partial metamorphosis, where all of that change is condensed into just one dormant period, the, the chrysalis stage, or the... Uh, um, I'm blanking on the other term for that. It's... Uh, uh, the pupa stage. A lot of times when, um, you know, when beetles and stuff go through it, we call it a pupa stage. And that's, I think really just because people didn't realize that it's the same thing when they were naming it <laughs> in the first place. So that's, that's my response for that question. Uh, I'm going to go to, I'm going to pull out of here. going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. Um, and I'm going to go back to, uh, let's see. Oh, there's me again. Um, <laughs> again, I'm totally new to this live broadcast stuff. So bear with me here. Um, I'm going to get back to see comments, looking at comments. Um, don't you ever address questions? So, um, I'm now looking in the chat here for a moment. I'm going to try to address some people's questions here. Let me see if we got any. Um, what happens to the brain of the thing when it morphs? So we used to think that when a butterfly goes, or when a butterfly is in a chrysalis, that it's entire body dissolves and then grows anew. People thought that it was kind of like a second egg. That is not the case. Uh, I mean, if you cut one open, it kind of just turns into goo. And if you open it up, it, it all pulls apart really easily. Uh, and it seems like the whole thing is dissolved. That's not actually not the case. So there are structures that stay intact. The nervous system, parts of the nervous system stay intact during all that. Uh, that's one of the, the really important things to note. And actually you can, <laughs> adult butterflies will actually remember things that they learned when they were caterpillars, which is fascinating. There's been experiments on that. A, a lot of the body actually does stay intact. So parts of it dissolve, parts of it uh, stay intact. You know, the, the front three legs in a caterpillar end up becoming the, 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 sorry, the, the front six legs of a caterpillar end up becoming the six legs of the adult. There's a little bit of tissue in there that, um, that becomes the, uh, a cat, the, the butterfly um, body parts. And I actually, there's a word for this. Um, so we call it the imaginal discs. They are these cellular structures that never dissolve during the uh, pupa stage. There are these little cellular structures that start proliferating uh, rapidly after the, the chrysalis is formed. And those end up giving rise to the adult stages. And so those exist in the base of the legs and they exist in, in a bunch of different stages, a bunch of different spots in the body of the caterpillar. So they're already in there. And actually in some, some moths, for example, like uh, silk, the, the moths we use for silk, so silkworms, you can actually dissect a silkworm and find miniature wings underneath its skin. They're really uh, primitively formed wings, but they're there. And those just start to grow rapidly once they go into a chrysalis form. They actually spin a cocoon and go into a chrysalis. Uh, so everything's already there. It's Hopefully that answers that question. Um, 
let's see. I'm, there's a lot of people talking in here, and it's kind of hard to see actual questions. If any of you have some questions that I didn't answer, um, instead of me scrolling back through all of the uh, the uh, discussion here, ask them again before I go through um, before I go to the next little presentation here. I'd like to try and answer any questions that you have on this. Okay. So um, it's asked, if you mixed butterfly soup uh, within the chrysalis with some other butterfly soup, would it just kill them or could you get a new butterfly maybe? <laughs> um, that's actually an interesting question. I don't, I don't know that anyone's done that. Uh, I would imagine that it would, it would be fatal to the animal. But you might be able to get away with that. I, the reason I say it would probably be fatal is – you know, our bodies, our immune systems, at least in mammals, attack foreign cells. And I imagine that the same is true in insects, but I don't know. That's a good, that's a really good question. Um, you certainly could move things around in there if you're really careful and get things to come out messed up. Uh, uh, that's likely possible, but I don't think you could actually mix uh, parts from other species. Um Can you re-explain why the creatures that metamorph, you said everything kind of does this. So for butterfly, is that more advantage to meta faster? I don't really understand that question. Someone asked, how did they evolve those fake owl eyes? Is that specific to its location? Um, we don't really know, I guess, step by step how that evolved, but we do know the genetics behind how that works. Uh, and I'm not familiar with it enough to really talk about it with authority here, but there is a book, um, I'm blanking on the name of it right now, that I read years ago that talks about the genetics of that and um, it's on evolutionary development, Evo Devo. What's the name of that book? It's, if anyone can think of that book, um, put that in the comments here. Uh, it's by Sean Carroll and it's kind of an over overview of the science of Evo Devo evolutionary development, which mixes embryology with our understanding of, of evolution to, uh, to give us, you know, to, to come up with a, a better understanding of how these different, different, um, things evolved. Uh, oh, so someone's asking, I guess, so why did butterflies metamorph in the first place? You mentioned that everything does this to some degree. So it's just better for butterflies to do it all at once. Uh, I think, so what we think happened, there's, there's a model of the selective pressures that might have driven this type of evolution. And we think that this started out with, uh, babies hatching prematurely. So it, it, the, the cool thing about being able to hatch prematurely is that you don't need as, as large of an egg. You know, if you can, if you can hatch prematurely and then just eat a bunch of food, you don't need a huge egg with lots of yolk to support you while you mature. So we think that probably the first step in the evolution of metamorphosis was 
eggs hatching early and you know so so they hatch in these these larva states because if you look at a silverfish for example they they go through these same stages this larva like stage but they do that inside the egg so the first kind of step in the evolution of metamorphosis was hatching early and finding food on their own and the huge advantage of that is that you can lay more eggs because the eggs are all smaller and so you know that's that's an advantage in certain environments, being able to lay more eggs that are smaller. Uh, so that would be an advantage in, in any sort of an environment where most of your kids are not going to survive. That type of adaptation would be helpful. Having more kids and them having to uh, fend for themselves a little bit more, that could be an advantage. And when we, when we look at the organisms that go through partial metamorphosis, like the, the milkweed bugs that I, I showed you. And by the way, also grasshoppers go through partial metamorphosis, um, uh, praying mantises. There's a whole bunch of animals of, that go through partial metamorphosis. They actually start out with, uh, um, some, some of them actually do hatch a little bit early and they're in a kind of larval-like stage, but they they mature out of that through, oh, someone just said that the name of the book, it's at Endless Forms Most Beautiful. That's that's the book where it, it goes into the detail of the genetics and the um, the process behind these eye spots and butterflies. And I apologize for not being fresh enough on that to actually explain it um, here, but yeah, that's, that's the book, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. Um, Sorry, I got sidetracked with my doing these live chats. I'm, I'm getting easily sidetracked. I apologize. But the um, I was talking about. Oh, yeah. Why did why did why was it an advantage to evolve metamorphosis? So the, the first big advantage is being able to hatch early, which allows you to have smaller eggs because you don't have to make all that yolk for your egg to uh, for, for your your baby to mature fully before it hatches. And the second big advantage is, you know, not being, not having to compete with the adults for food. So these, these animals that go through partial metamorphosis, uh, as they grow and as they mature, they start to compete more and more with their parents for food. And that's, that's the disadvantage of partial metamorphosis. And the big advantages of full metamorphosis is, is that you, you don't have to compete with your parents for, for food. And so that's, that's the model that scientists have put forward right now. There's a really good article that summarizes all the different thoughts that scientists have had on why metamorphosis evolved on Scientific America. Uh, and if you, if you do a Google for the evolution of metamorphosis, you'll find this pretty high up in the Google search results. It's, it's an article by Scientific America. Actually, let me try and pull that up. Um, Cause it's a really, really good article. And, oh, how did insect metamorphosis evolve? And let me share my screen here. Hold on. Uh, share screen. Share. Ooh, we got a tunnel of infinity going on here. Um, oops. So here is the article. Um, how did insect metamorphosis evolve. And I highly recommend reading through this uh, because it goes through a bunch of different ideas that scientists have had over the years. It goes through the history of the study of this. You know, it, in, it talks about how in the early days, we used to think that the entire animal melts inside of the chrysalis. Um, that does not happen, but it, it, it goes through the history of this and it's, it's really, really fascinating. Um, and it highlights a the, the best model that we have, which is put forth by um, Lynn Ritterford and James Truman um, for, 
from the uh, University of Washington in Seattle, and they actually go through the genetics. They actually show you from a gene's perspective even what's going on in, in the evolution of metamorphosis. And there's some really, really neat connections when you look at the genetics between um, animals that go through partial metamorphosis and animals that go through full metamorphosis. And there's some really neat connections um, between even you know the way that humans mature and the way that insects mature and, and go through these processes. So check that out. And if you really wanna get nerdy, go and read the actual scientific literature. There's links to that in this article. It's a really great article that overviews everything. So with that, uh, let me, let me get back to my presentation here. Um, let's see. <laughs> Shannon, Shannon asks, but whale balls, don't worry. That's the next topic. The next thing that we're going to talk about here is whale ball. Ooh, I'm still sharing my screen. Look at that. Um, whale balls is next up on the list. <laughs> so, okay. Let's pull up my presentation. Uh, I gotta go through the whole thing again. Whale balls. So <laughs> I got this question on, this was probably years ago. I, I did an animation for Stated Clearly. For those of you who don't know, I am the guy that does the Stated Clearly animations. That's my other YouTube channel. And years ago I did an animation about the evolution of whales. And I got this um, letter shortly after um, publishing that. And it was a very angry letter, but I, you know, when people are angry at me, I like to, instead of responding in kind and being angry back, I like to, to try and see if there's a legitimate question within their angry comment. And I like to just try and respond to that question because uh, that's, I mean, th that, that's how we take, these horrible conversations that happen online and turn them into productive conversations, right? So he writes, you honestly think that whales evolved from land animals? Learn biology and stop lying to kids, three exclamation points, you know, all, all caps. Whales have internal testicles cooled by a complex countercurrent cooling system. You idiot. <laughs> Look it up. How did that evolve? Here's a link for you because you're clearly too dumb to find it on your own. And he sends me a link to, um, Evolution news. Actually, sorry, I said that this was this was a while ago, but this um, this email was actually recent because this article is recent. So I've I've gotten a lot of emails like this in the past. But he sends me a link to evolution evolutionnews.org. And evolution news is a website that's is was created by the intelligent design community. So the um uh the, like, you know, Michael Behe and those guys, the Discovery Institute. It's, it's this organization that's based in Seattle and they, they try and, they try and put forth uh, pro anti-evolution propaganda. And they built a website called Evolution News where they put forth all these different lies about evolution, all this anti-evolution propaganda. So he, he sends me a link to link there. And, and then he quotes me a, a part of that um, that article it says internalization of test of the testicle could not have preceded the countercurrent heat exchange system or the male cetacean cetacean is the technical word for whale or the male cetacean would have been sterile yet there is no adaptive advantage to having a countercurrent heat exchange system around the testicle unless it is inside the body um, so here is the actual article that came from and uh, it's written by Jonathan Wells. Jonathan Wells is a biologist. He's a PhD biologist that, um, you know, he got his PhD so that he could re write creationist material and have some credentials behind him. His stuff is absolute garbage. He wrote a book. I, ha I have his, I have one of his books um, where he just, I mean, it's just absolute misinformation. And, and we're going to see here 
how how horribly dishonest he is uh, in this article too. Uh, but so he's got a whole article about how it would be way too difficult for bears to evolve into whales. Um, and by the way, the current model is not that bears evolved into whales. Uh, whales evolved from within artiodactyls. Um, so artiodactyls are, are hooved animals and the closest living relative to a whale is the hippo. But when Darwin was first speculating about whale evolution, he, he, he put forth the speculation that, oh, maybe they evolved from something like a, uh, like a bear. You could imagine something like a bear spending more and more time in the water and eventually evolving these aquatic characteristics uh, across multiple, multiple generations. And so he's attacking that here. Um, but in his article, he has this diagram that shows the countercurrent heat exchange system that surrounds the testicles of whales. So for those that don't know, whales have their testicles inside their body instead of having, you know, a scrotum. We're gonna have to talk. We're gonna have to talk about scrotums today. <laughs> so hope you're all hope you're all cool with that. So. Obviously most animals have, most mammals hold their testicles inside of a scrotum. And the benefit there is that we can control the temperature of our testicles because sperm production happens best at between four and five degrees cooler than body temperature for most mammals. That's not true for all mammals, but for most mammals, that's the case. And that actually is the case for cetaceans so far as we can tell too. They, they need their testicles to be slightly cooler than their body temperature. And because the testicles are inside, well, how do you go about doing that? Well, the, the solution that has evolved, um, which he's pointing out here, is this countercurrent heat exchange system. And, and what this is, is you've got um, blood vessels uh, that are taking cool um, blood from the skin, and particularly from the tail flukes and the, the, uh, the, uh, and blanking on the name of the thing that's on a, on a whale's back right now. <laughs> the, but it takes cool blood from the skin and the outside of the body, and it pumps that around the testicles. And it pumps that near the blood vessels that have hot blood in them, and it actually cools that blood down so that the blood, when it gets to the testicles, is actually nice and cool. And it keeps them at this temperature of about five degrees cooler than the rest of the body. This is a really complicated system, right? These countercurrent heat exchange systems are very complicated. And his argument is, you know, the internalization of the testicle could not have preceded the countercurrent heat exchange system, or the male cetacean would have been sterile. And that's a really good point, right? Because the main thing that, if you could say that evolution cares about something, about anything, and cares in, in quotes, because of course, the process of evolution is not a thinking process, but it does, it does end up behaving, you could say, intelligently be, through the process of descent with modification, acted upon by selection. You know, the thing that selection selects for the most is fertility, because what really counts is whether or not you can pass offspring onto the next generation. So if there is any change in morphology that made you less likely to reproduce, well, that's that change, that mutation that caused that change, that's going to get weeded out right away. So he's saying, you know, internalization of the testicle of the testicle could not have preceded the countercurrent heat exchange system, or the male cetacean would have been sterile. Yet there is no adaptive advantage to having a countercurrent heat exchange system around the testicle unless it is inside the body. So he's like, you know, this is a chicken and egg conundrum. How do you get this complicated? heat system to evolve before it's needed, right? Seems like, seems like a difficulty, seems like an issue for evolution until you realize that guess what? All mammals already have a countercurrent heat exchange system. And we have this system all throughout our bodies. When you go for a jog and you start to blush, What's happening is that you've got this countercurrent heat exchange system that's going that that's being turned on. You have by your your blood vessels have heat sensitive muscles on them, and uh, when your temperature is out of whack, 
when your muscles are moving and heating you up too much on the inside, certain, certain vessels contract, causing blood to flow differently than normal than when you're resting. And that causes blood to flow near the surface of your skin. It allows you to cool off, allows your, the inside of your body to cool off and, and exchange uh, temperature with, with the outside air. Uh, when you get too cold, when it's too cold outside, other muscles will uh, tense up, causing blood to flow differently. So these countercurrent heat exchange systems already exist in mammals. Not only do they exist in mammals, they exist in reptiles, they exist in birds, they exist in fish. So this is a really, really ancient system that has been around and evolving for millions and millions and millions of years. It, it preceded the evolution of whales dramatically. And I talk about this, I actually started a blog a few years back. And back in, in 2016, I actually wrote an article specifically about this and a bunch of other claims about whales. So creationists for a long time have been, have been attacking the evolution of whales, saying that it's impossible. And there's a guy, Richard Sternberg, that did a talk where he presents 15, uh, 15 crazy changes that would have to happen from land animal to whale that make it impossible for whales to have evolved. And I, I go through that in this, in this blog article, in this blog article. And I, I address each one of those 15 um, issues. One of those is this testicle issue. So creationists have been talking about whale testicles for a long time, whale balls as evidence against evolution um, for quite some time now. And in this article, um, yeah, go check that out when you when you get a chance. I I kind of gave up on my blog. Um, I'm not really that much of a writer. It turns out I started doing it. I think there's like ten articles on there or something or nine something like that. But yeah, I do have a blog. <laughs> I haven't written it since written in it since 2016. But there there's some cool stuff on there. So go see if you can find that when you get a chance. Um, but this here is what, what this countercurrent heat exchange system actually looks like. This is from a sheep um, here pictured on the right. I got that picture from Wikipedia. Um, we call this, um, I'm going to pronounce this wrong. I've never actually heard this said out loud, so I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, but radia marabilia is what these are called. And it's a complex of arteries and veins lying very close to each other found in some vertebrates. Uh, actually, it turns out most vertebrates have structures like this somewhere in their circulatory system. And it, it acts as a countercurrent exchanger. And not only can, can this um, exchange heat, but blood vessels can actually exchange um, oxygen and other gases this way as well. And what, what happens is that uh, vessels that are flowing have blood flowing one way are surrounded by vessels that are flowing in the opposite way. And that allows these, these um, heat exchanges to occur. And by tightening or loosening certain vessels, you can actually uh, control how, how, uh, how much exchange is happening. So this is a very, very ancient system that it's existed for a long time. But now, so, Okay, so so mammals already have a countercurrent heat exchange system, but do we have that in our testicles? Is the the fact that whales have this exchange system in their testicles is that a new thing? Is that did that have to evolve de novo, or is, is this a, this a very unique special thing to whales? Turns out that the answer is no. Uh, it took me a while to find this because I'm not an expert on testicles. <laughs> So I didn't just know off the top of my head whether or not this is the case. But there is an article that I found on a website by the University of Missouri, their extension service. So they, um, for those that don't know, a lot of universities have an extension service where they, they do kind of outreach. So they'll, they'll publish a lot of their um, lectures and stuff online. Most, a lot of universities have this now, especially state funded universities, which it's really cool. Uh, you can, pretty much get an education for free these days. Uh, you won't get a certificate. Uh, uh, well, actually some, some, some universities do like an extension certificate. You can go through a training program with them and actually get a certificate. But uh, 
you can get pretty much all the information you'd ever want for free these days, which is awesome. This new experiment in, in education that the world is, is going through right now. But they have, uh, they've got a, a series of articles on uh, bull physiology on, on cattle for people that are raising cattle so they can, they can know what to look out for and, you know, be smart about it. And they've got a whole article on the testicles of cattle. And in there, they talk about the, you know, most, most mammals need their testicles at about four to five degrees lower in temperature than their body temperature in order to, to maximize sperm production. When, when the testicles are at body temperature, they still do produce sperm, but they do it at a slower rate. So it's not total sterilization, but it's, you know, it's sperm production is impeded. And when we're talking about evolution, anything that makes you slightly worse at producing sperm, that's a huge disadvantage on an evolutionary time scale, especially with animals like whales and with cattle that will, um, you know, a lot of times a female will, will mate, well, maybe not so much with cattle. A lot of times with cattle, there'll be a fight and then one male will pretty much have um, access to all the females in that group. But there's a lot of whale species today that the females will melt, will mate with multiple partners. And most of the competition about who gets to become the father happens at the level of the sperm. So producing lots of sperm is extremely important for species that, that reproduce like that, you know, and this does happen even with, with cattle. Um, even if one male dominates the population and gets all the females to himself, he doesn't really get all the females to himself. There's a lot of, um, you know, females will go mate with other males afterwards too. And so there's a lot of competition at the level of sperm. And so high sperm production is very important uh, throughout evolutionary time for males. So this body temperature needs to be regulated. And this article says that the temperature regulation is done by coordination of three structures, a temperature sensitive layer of muscle the tunica dartis located in the walls of the scrotum. So, you know, scrotum relaxes or tightens up depending on the temperature. Uh, this, uh, it, which relaxes when hot and contracts when cold. The external, <laughs> again, pronouncing things I've never said before out loud. The external cremister muscle within the uh, spermatic cord, which controls the proximity of the testicle to the body by lengthening or shortening, depending on the environmental temperature, and a countercurrent temperature exchange regulated by blood flow process, uh, by a blood flow process known as the pampiniform plexus, which is a coil of testicular veins that provide an effective mechanism for cooling arterial blood entering the testicle and transferring its heat to the venous blood leaving the testicle. So this entire issue that Jonathan Wells, a trained biologist, he wrote an entire article about this on Evolution News. His entire argument that he puts forth in an, on a website called Evolution News is completely false because apparently he doesn't know very much about testicular anatomy. I mean, granted, <laughs> Very few people do spend a lot of time studying testicular anatomy, but if you're going to, as a biologist, write an article on a website called Evolution News, I do suggest looking up the topic before you write. It's extremely dishonest to make the claims that he's, he's made. So um, to Matthew H, my answer to your question, um, I, guess, I guess he didn't really have a question. Um, he just wanted me to, to look things up and uh, teach things correctly. Um, your, uh, your issue that you have with the evolution of whales, at least the one that you brought up to me, is, is a false issue. Uh, the, when we read this claim again, internalization of the testicle could not have preceded the countercurrent heat exchange system or the male cetacean would have been sterile Yet there is no adaptive advantage to having a countercurrent heat exchange system around the testicles unless it is inside the body. That entire claim is false. There already is a huge advantage to having a countercurrent heat exchange system around the testicle because controlling the temperature of 
testicles is so important that even uh, just the <laughs> the the muscles of the scrotum can't do a good enough job of, of regulating that temperature. And so this system already evolved and it already evolved within the animals, um, the hooved animals, which whales are hooved animals. This system already evolved. It exists in cattle. It exists in humans. You have it in your own body. This is a, um, this is a false issue <laughs> with the evolution of whales. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. I'm going to go back and look at comments and see if there's any questions here that I should answer, respond to here. Um, hopefully everybody's enjoying this. Uh, normally, of course, I don't stutter as much when I'm doing videos for Stated Casually and Stated Clearly because I edit things. So hopefully you're okay with my stuttering here, but um, let's see. Have we got any questions here? Mm -hmm. Seems like uh, the conversation got off topic here in the comments. <laughs> Someone says, man, you should have said sperm whale. Will you please explain what infinite regress is? So anyone have any actual questions that are on topic? <laughs> Seems like people got into a religion debate over here. Um, Yeah, people got into like a religion -y debate. And uh, John, are you a geneticist? No, I'm not a geneticist. I am, I, so I am a, I guess you could say I'm a science journalist or science communicator. I, I work with scientists. I go to their labs. I work alongside scientists to publicize their work and simplify it for the public. So stated clearly, is a project that I started in 2012 where I started doing these animations online. And the, the first animation I did is what is DNA and how does it work? And I made that on my own, just out of frustration. I was frustrated with how genetics was taught in college. We really overcomplicate things when we teach genetics, the way that genetics is taught in textbooks. It's not really um, anyone's fault. I mean, genetics is a very new field and we've been learning it slowly and we've been like, as we learn something new, we insert that into to the textbook. And the way that the way that genetics is taught in textbooks is kind of like, it's been just evolving over time. And it seems like no one's really just stopped and restarted like, okay, how can we explain this better now that we know all the stuff that we know? And so when you take a genetics class, it's really convoluted. You start, you start off by learning these, complex things about how nucleotides are structured. Um, and this is stuff that doesn't really, it's not that important when you just want a really good general overview of how genetics works. I was frustrated with that. So I made this video, what is DNA and how does it work? Five minute video. And that just exploded in popularity. Teachers were using it in colleges in high schools and middle schools. And I even got a letter from a lady saying that she was using it in her home school. She, homeschools her kids and her daughter is 10 years old and she watched my video. And now she's teaching her, her friends how DNA works. Um, so after producing that video, I started getting contacted by researchers saying, Hey, we're doing this and we want you to simplify it for the public and do an animation about it. And so I started working with different universities. I work with um, Stuart West at Oxford. He's one of the one of the guys that I work with, um, and I work with the Center for Chemical Evolution at Georgia Tech. And right now, I'm also working with the Castle Research Center, 
their chemists at um, uh, UC Irvine. And so I'll go and I'll hang out with these researchers. We meet on Skype. I'll go to their laboratory. I've, I've met Stu. I actually went to England and met Stuart West. Um, got to check out some of his research. And it's, it's really neat because these people will uh, just tutor me. Um, it's a really neat, <laughs> for me, way to learn science because I have access to the, the top researchers in these fields and they'll just hang out with me. They'll Skype with me and we'll, um, I'll go to their labs and, and learn what they're doing. And then I uh, simplify that for the public. So that's, that's my, my background. I am not a geneticist. I guess you could call me a journalist, but it's this new um, world of YouTube where we're not really totally sure what to call ourselves. A lot of people will call me a science communicator too. Um, why did the male whale eat a boat full of sailors in order? Uh, okay, that's a joke. Okay, got it. <laughs> Trying to read some more questions here. Why would balls evolve in the first place? Okay, well, that's a good question. Um, we are eukaryotes. You could say that the balls are the whole purpose of our body. Like our body is an extension of our balls. You could say, um, sorry, our bodies are an extension of either our balls or our, <laughs> our ovaries. Our, so our testicles are our ovaries. We, um, we, if, if you look at simpler eukaryotes, like single celled eukaryotes, they, Sexual reproduction is just the mixing of genes with a partner, the reshuffling of genes with a partner to create offspring. And there are single-celled eukaryotes that do this as well. And uh, multi-celled organisms, uh, the, the purpose of being a multi-celled organism, I guess, you can say that the selective advantage leading to multi-celled organisms, when you could just have single-celled organisms doing their thing. Um, I've got a whole animation on that called um, what caused life's major evolutionary transitions? And it goes through why multi, what types of evolutionary pressures could have given rise to multi-celled organisms. And basically there's, there's a lot of advantage of being a multi-celled organism. You can, uh, you can survive more varied environments, for example, when you've got a nice large body um, that's protecting your, uh, your sex cells. When you've got a nice large body protecting those sex cells, you can survive crazier um, variations in environment. You can survive predation from other organisms better. There's lots of advantages to being a large animal, but you really could think of our bodies as giant machines or housing for our sex cells. Like reproduction is the foundation of biology. So pretty much everything that we do in life is to help us either survive or reproduce. And that's, that's true in every organism from plants to animals to bacteria, you know. Bacteria don't reproduce sexually, but they do conjugate, which is kind of similar to sexual reproduction where they do swap genes with each other, but they don't fully shuffle their genomes the way that we do. That's, that's, full on sexual reproduction, which is the actual shuffling of genes with a partner to produce a unique offspring. That is unique to eukaryotes, which are um, plants, animals, uh, and like protists. So there's, there's a lot of single celled eukaryotes. So anyway, hopefully that answers that question. Now, originally I wanted to do, again, I wanted to do a, a third topic today. Uh, hold on. Let me look at more questions here. Um, <laughs> someone says, Oh, by the way, if you guys, if you guys want to be extra nice, you can do a super chat and that gives me some money. And that also makes sure that I, I see your comment or your question. Um, so I guess uh, the, you know, this is a Sunday morning session, so the super chat is like the the donation plate, right? I should have organ music playing in the background, and 
I should go on a, a give a speech while there's nice organ music playing in the background as to why you should contribute 10% of your income to my super chat. But um, so, so someone says, if we are just an extension of our balls, <laughs> is this the reason some people use their balls to think for them? I would say yes. Uh, <laughs> some of us, uh, some of us have escaped the, uh, the evolutionary control of our, of our behavior and thought processes more than others. Um, diapsids. Sorry. This is the part of the, the broadcast where I mutter to myself while reading comments. Seems like uh, people's questions have been answered. So if you have a burning question and it has not been answered, uh, ask it right now in the chats. Re-ask it, I guess. Oh, someone gave me a super chat. J.R. Pone. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Um, he says, love your stuff, John. You're an inspiration. Keep it up. Why, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> some comment about raptors. Uh, and my battery is running low and I'm, I'm getting, uh, low on time here. So I, I am, let's see any, uh, I, I guess someone asked about birds having a higher than normal temperature. Birds do have a higher than normal temperature and also <laughs> birds have internal testicles. I'm not sure if bird sperm is produced at a higher temperature than mammal sperm is. I'm not sure if they, need to spend a lot of energy cooling down their testicles or not. That's that. And that's a good question, but birds have internal testicles and they run. I think I want to say that birds run at a temperature about four degrees higher than mammals do. Oh, another, another, um, contribution. Thank you. Um, says love, love your episode on the non-sex show.
Okay, folks, I'm back. My computer just died. I apologize. Um, see, these are the things that I learned in, in this first little experiment with um, <laughs> with a uh, you know live broadcast. I should probably plug in my laptop before I start a broadcast. That would be beneficial. So I'm I'm going to go ahead and end this this broadcast now. Hopefully, um, I was able to answer people's questions. Uh, Thank you very much to the people who did, uh, you know, um, super chats. I appreciate the support. Thanks to everybody who's been supporting uh, my work over the years, just subscribing and doing, sharing my videos and uh, getting people excited about this. I will be doing another broadcast next Sunday at the same time. And there I'm going to be talking about uh, the evolution of function from non-function. Uh, I was going to do that today, but as I was creating slides last night, I realized there's so much to this that uh, it really deserves its own discussion. So look forward to that. Um, tell your friends about it. Tweet about it. Um, my Twitter handle is at stated clearly. Follow me on Twitter if you're not doing so already. Uh, and you know, I've got a Facebook page as well, stated clearly Facebook page. And yeah, by the way, I, I'm sitting on the floor now next next to the plug-in because my cord's not long enough to, to plug in my computer where I was actually doing the broadcast. Those are my, my lights back there. Um, but yes, this was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, and hopefully I'll get better at doing these as time goes on. I'll stutter less. I'll ramble less. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get better at this. So. So long for now, stay curious.